Hello, and welcome to yet another video from Dr. Vev. This is one of the most famous problems in the history of both mathematics and physics, and is known as the Brachistochrone problem. It roughly translates into finding the shape of a curve that has a least time property. So the way I like to set up this problem, because I don't want to worry about uh, particle leaving the track due to high curvature and things like that. So I'm imagining a bead constrained to move in a wire between points A and B. You're free to shape the wire any way you want and there's a constant gravitational field downwards. So determine the shape of the curve gamma in two dimensions such that the time taken for a bead sliding along gamma is the least possible. I'll be looking at several solutions. The great solution of John Bernoulli is what I'll focus on initially. And then we'll do the modern solution using variational calculus, i.e. Euler's equation. The answer will turn out to be a portion of the cycloid. So I've given away the answer. And then we'll talk a little bit about some miscellaneous properties of uh, this Brachistochrone curve, such as scale invariance, and it has got this property called totochrone. I'll describe what it is. And I'll also describe the isochronous pendulum. So first of all, let's try to understand why a straight line is not an answer. The straight line is the shortest distance in space between two points, but it's not the shortest distance in time between two points. Now, why is that? Uh, if we start by assuming that you have a straight line, let's see what happens. If I connect up points A and B with a straight line, first of all, you notice that the slope is constant. And the acceleration is uh, gonna be a portion of gravity. It's gonna be G sine alpha, where alpha is this angle that this incline makes. Now, a constant acceleration seems like a good idea, but actually it's not. Remember, this particle is starting from rest. So initially, its uh, speed is gonna be very small speed of a particle is given by the acceleration times the time. For small values of time, the ac uh, acceleration times time is a small speed. So it's gonna waste a lot of time building up to a decent speed. And then by the time it's got to be moving really fast, it's too late, it's already arrived at B. So what we need is a curve where there's a lot of acceleration at first, and that will be a curve that looks like that because this alpha is extremely steep, it's close to 90 degrees. So you're getting the full benefit of gravity. And then once it's built up all that speed, you don't really care how that curve looks after that. So that's the reason why we expect a curve to look like this. So just based on plain common sense, we know that the answer cannot be a straight line. Now, while we are at it, let's try to find the speed of the particle at point C. Now, of course, if you don't know what the curve is, you can't find the speed uh, of the particle using the curve, but you can use what's called the conservation of energy and get the speed as a function of the distance that the particle has fallen. So let's assume that going from A to C, the particle's fallen by a distance Y, then the potential energy lost is the kinetic energy gained by the bead. Uh, and so we can write, that equation, uh, it's just mgy equals one half mv squared. Uh, here the velocity is uh, tangent to that curve at any given time because the bead is constrained to move on the wire, uh, wire frame. So m cancels out. This is the great Galilean um, cancellation. So I get the velocity v equals the square root of two gy. So that um, is kind of basic physics and we need this to proceed further. Now I have here one of my favorite books. And this is the book called The Science of Mechanics by Ernst Mach. Mach was a very big deal back in the day. Einstein was very influenced by Mach. Mach was already a great man uh, close to his death. As you can see, Mach died in 1916 and Einstein um, published general relativity in 1915. So Einstein was a young man full of uh, youthful vigor and Mach was already dead. But Mach's principle, um, which is now called equivalence principle by Einstein, 
was very inst uh, very instrumental in pushing forward general relativity. Uh, by the way, the Mark is also the same scientist after whom the speeds of aircraft that move really fast are named. Mark one means going at the speed of sound. Mark two means twice the speed of sound and so forth. So this science of mechanics is a beautiful uh, philosophical and historical treatise of the development of all the great ideas in mechanics. I highly recommend that, that you get this. I myself got the ninth edition for quite a bit of money. The first edition will probably sell for thousands, but uh, I have the ninth edition here. Um, and the ninth edition was 1933, pretty late, much after um, Ernst Mach's death and uh, his son Ludwig Mach was the one who um, published this edition. So uh, let's go to, uh, John Bernoulli had the habit of uh, posing problems to the European intellectuals of the time and so he posed this problem uh, propounded by John Bernoulli in 1696. Okay, that's the brachistochrome problem. The problem was very ingeniously solved by John Bernoulli himself and solutions were also supplied by Leibniz, L'Hopital, Newton and James Bernoulli. He then describes the great solution of John Bernoulli. He thinks that the most remarkable solution is John Bernoulli's itself. Uh, the only problem with uh, Mark's notation is that he takes X to be downward and Y to be to the right. So I'm not gonna mess with this anymore. I'll close the book and use my treatment where X and Y are the usual things. Y is downwards and X is to the right. Okay, so we need a little bit of background to understand the great solution of John Bernoulli. So uh, around that time, there was a scientist known as Pierre Fermat. And Fermat, among other things, famous for several theorems, like Fermat's last theorem, which was only recently proved. So Fermat advocated a principle which actually is now the cornerstone of all of physics. The least action or extremal action principle comes from actually Fermat's principle. Fermat's main concern was light. So Fermat tried to understand why light moves the way it does. So his principle is that light moves in extremal time paths. So Fermat was very careful not to say minimum time because there are situations admittedly manufactured or made up situations where light actually moves, takes the path of greatest time. So Fermat said extremal time, which means that it can be great, greatest, least, or neither greatest, not least, or a saddle point. So that's Fermat's principle. And at that time, the law of reflection was called uh, uh, Heron's problem, the ancient Greek Heron. The law of reflection was, uh, equal angles are made between the incident ray and the reflected ray. Uh, well, that was obvious because uh, the shortest time, or the shortest space uh, path was one that uh, was equal. But here, when light goes from one medium to another medium, the Heron's result is not true. Actually, as you all know, light bends. So let's if you have A here and B in a different medium, so let's say medium one has got refractive index N1 like air and N2 like water, then you're gonna have light take this bent path. And as you've studied in elementary uh, classes, uh, the, if the theta one and theta two are the angles with respect to the normal, then the law of Snell is uh, obeyed. So Snell's law, Snell was an Englishman who experimentally prove this law and that is n1 times sine theta one equals n2 times sine theta two. So this was common knowledge at Bernoulli's time. Uh, the refractive index of a material is defined as the ratio of the speed of light in vacuum to the speed in the material. So let's write it like that. C over V1 uh, sine theta one equals C over V2 
sine theta 2. I like this definition a lot because it shows that the refractive index has to be always bigger than one um, since the speed of light in vacuum cannot be exceeded. So the uh, speed C cancels out and I can write sine theta over V equals constant. So this is generally the property, I'll call this constant K. So you can think of uh, this as a well-known fact of life. So what did John Bernoulli do? He made the amazing leap of insight. He said, forget about the bead, forget about the wire. Let's think about light. Let's think about light going down in a medium where the speed of light increases as you go down. So how can you imagine that? Imagine there's some kind of molasses where the top surface is really murky. And as you go down, it gets lighter and lighter and becomes pure water or something at the end. You can think of whatever you want. So when you have a situation like that, light's gonna, because the, uh, because the um, refractive index is decreasing, it's gonna bend outward from the normal. So it's gonna take this successive uh, paths are gonna be bent away from the normal. So if we draw these normals here, it's gonna look opposite of that, okay? Because here I'm assuming you have something like air and water here, air and water, that's gonna look like that. But if you have water and then air, it's gonna look opposite. Uh, I'm gonna call these angles by, um, you know, theta. So here also, I'm gonna have sine theta over V equals constant. Now, what is sine theta? Look at, these layers are supposed to be really close together. So we're thinking already calculus. So uh, if you look at this layer, that's dy. So that is dx. And this of course is ds, the arc length. So ds is this part. And in the limit, as you bring these layers very close together, you get a smooth curve and not this bent jagged uh, thing that I've drawn. So um, what can we do? You can use trigonometry. So let's use trig. So dy uh, by ds Well, dy by ds is uh, uh, adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's gonna be cosine theta. Well, that's not what we need. Let's try dx by ds. dx by ds is sine theta. So that's what we need. So dx by ds is sine theta. Let's try to work with this. Sine theta is v times k, so we can write that straight away using Fermat's principle. Great. So now let us square both sides. If I square both sides and after transferring ds over there, I'm gonna get dx squared equals uh, v squared k squared uh, ds squared, which is dx squared plus dy squared. In the previous video, I showed you that in a uh, two-dimensional space uh, known as R2, the metric tensor uh, ds squared is dx squared plus dy squared. So that's uh, the arc element squared. Now I'm gonna assemble uh, this so that dy by dx, I want dy by dx. So that's uh, what I'm after. Uh, so let me solve for that. So that's just some algebra. So let's do that. Uh, this gives me dx squared equals v squared k squared dx squared plus v squared k squared dy squared. So now I'm gonna solve for dy squared. So v squared k squared dy squared will be dx squared. I'll transfer this to the left, one minus uh, v squared k squared. So now I'll divide by v squared k squared and then dx on this side. So I get dy squared over dx squared equals one minus v squared k squared over um, <clears throat> v squared k squared. 
At this point, I'm going to use what v squared is. Well, it's uh, 2gy. So that's 2gk squared y divided by 2gk squared y. And then I'll take the square root, plus or minus, but I'll keep the plus sign. OK, so that gives me dy by dx equals the square root of 1 minus 2gk squared y over 2gk squared y. When John Bernoulli obtained this, he immediately knew what the answer was because this is the so-called differential equation for the cycloid. Um, so I'll do the following substitution. I'm going to call 1 over um, 2gk squared as 2a. Now bear with me, I have a reason to call it 2a. So I divide both sides by in this fraction by this quantity. So I'm going to get dy by dx equals the square root of 2a minus y over y. We'll later show this is the differential equation uh, for a cycloid. Uh, got by rolling a wheel of radius a. Now, I know that I was going to show you this eventually, properties of a cycloid, but let me just show you right now. I uh, have some space here and it looks odd. So I'm going to, um, I can't start the Euler calculation in this small space. So I might as well show you how the cycloid is generated. So you have a track that is fixed and then you draw a, um, have a wheel rolling on it without slipping. So that's important. So because it uh, should not slip, I'm going to have to hold both the ruler and this. So it's going to look awkward. Um, and then the locus of any point on the wheel is portions of a cycloid. So let's try drawing it. You can see it's barely moving here, and then it starts picking up speed, and it moves uh, faster and faster, and, and moves the fastest when it's at the top. Oops, I moved it. So that's your um, the locus of uh, wheel going like that, and the solution to this uh, brachistochrome problem is just is just that. There's your point A, and there's your point B, and the B has to slide on that cycloid. So it's a pretty beautiful thing uh, that nature has uh, done for us. Okay, and that's uh, the solution of uh, Bernoulli. And uh, Bernoulli's solution is still one of the best solutions. And uh, I just want to show you a couple of things that uh, he says about um, Bernoulli's solution. So the solution of John Bernoulli's achieved entirely without a method. The outcome of pure geometrical fancy and a skillful use of such knowledge as happened to be at his command is one of the most remarkable and beautiful performances in the history of physical science. John Bernoulli was an aesthetic genius in this field. And then he goes on to compare his character with that of his brothers and spends a few pages talking about his brother's solution, which comes close to the modern solution, but not quite. So I'm going to skip his brother's solution and go straight for the solution that we have in modern times. So how would you solve the Brachistochrome problem with the technology that we have? The key is using Euler's equation. So let's proceed by that. So the functional that we have to extremize is the time functional. So this is the uh, modern approach. 
Euler's approach is more general than John Bernoulli's approach because after people solve the initial brachistochrome problem, um, they also started complicating it. What if, the, what if there was air resistance? What if the air resistance was linear or quadratic? Then what is the path? What if there's a constant wind blowing in this direction? When they try to do problems of that type, they found that uh, the Fermat principle business does not work. You need a more general approach and the general approach is that of uh, variational calculus. So let's set up this problem more carefully because this is our uh, main bread and butter for this video. I have the y-axis this way, the x-axis to the right, um, <clears throat> our curve that we don't know yet A is the point one and B is the point two because in variational calculus we use one and two as our initial and final points. Um, our convention for potential energy is, this is zero for potential energy. So the potential energy is positive going there and negative going down. The curve that we have gamma is uh, to be found in the form Y as a function of X and the beads uh, position at any given time is X comma Y. And that's the origin by the way, zero comma zero. Uh, gravity is constant acting downward. So the same thing we had here applies. So that I'm going to use without um, proving it again. So the time functional can be written. It's time that we wish to minimize. So the time functional T, which is a function of the path that you're using is the integral from one to two. Well, what is time? Time is distance divided by speed. So it's DS divided by V, where DS is the small arc length that is traversed at any given time. And the speed is the instantaneous tangential velocity to the wire frame. All right, now uh, we already know that V is the square root of 2GY and DS is uh, this thing here. So DS squared, so DS is gonna be the square root of uh, DX squared plus DY squared. And since I want Y as a function of X, I'll choose to take DX outside. So that's gonna give me the square root of uh, one plus dy by dx, which is y prime squared times dx. So that's my ds. And now I can write my time functional, t as a function of the path y is the integral from one to two, square root of one plus y prime squared over the square root of two gy dx. So our uh, functional f only depends on y and y prime. And that is one plus y prime squared over y to the power half. I'm gonna ignore the factor of root two g because it doesn't play into the um, time minimization process. So we have this peculiarity that uh, the functional does not depend on x. Now here I'm gonna prove the result. So here's a lemma the alternative Euler equation. So generally speaking, if you had F as a function of Y, Y prime and X, you can write DF by DX as del F by del X plus del F by del Y times DY by DX plus del f by del y prime, dy prime by dx. That's just partial differential, uh, partial derivatives, okay? So I will, I'll write another equation to simplify this uh, writing. dy by dx is y prime, so that's y prime del f by del y, and dy prime over dx is y double prime. So that's y double prime times del f by del y prime. So by Euler's equation, 
I can replace del f by del y because del x by del y is just d by dx del f by del y prime. This is the so-called Euler equation. So I'm going to use Euler's equation there. So let's see uh, what that gives me. So I get uh, df by dx equals del f by del x. The second term becomes y prime d by dx del f by del y prime plus y double prime. This last term is unchanged del f by del y prime. Now this, if you notice, is Leibniz rule. So I can write this as del f by del x plus d by dx of y prime del f by del y prime. So if you go back and differentiate, you differentiate the first term, you get that. You differentiate the second term, you get that. So this can be written like that. And so there's a d by dx here, there's a d by dx there. So I'm going to write this like th as follows. This is d by dx of f minus the d by dx of this thing. So it's minus y prime del f by del y prime equals del f by del x. And now we are ready to um, write the oil alternative Euler equation. So the lemma is this, if f of y y prime x is equal to f of y and y prime, i.e. f does not depend on x, then f minus y prime del f by del y prime is constant. And so we have actually proved it in even setting it up, we have actually proved the uh, alternative Euler equation. This, uh, for those who are alert, is a kind of Jacobi integral. If uh, f is the Lagrangian, this is actually, the J and primes denote the time derivatives. This is none other than a Jacobi integral that we looked at earlier when we studied mechanics. But anyway, this is what we're gonna use for the Brachistochrome problem because uh, you don't have any X dependence. So we'll just directly get into, um, get into that. So back to business. f minus y prime del f by del y prime is a constant. So let's do that. f is uh, one plus y prime squared over y to the power half minus y prime. Well, if you take the derivative with respect to y prime, the denominator is left unchanged. So I'll focus on the numerator. I'll write the denominator as root y. I'll just focus on the numerator. So that's gonna be one half, one plus y prime squared to the power minus one half when you differentiate, but you go inside and differentiate the inside function and that's gonna be two y prime because you're differentiating with respect to y prime. And that's equal to constant, I'll call it C, not to be confused with the speed of light, of course. I cancel out the twos and let's see what I get now. Um, I have a one over square root of one plus y, uh, y prime squared. So if I take the common denominator, I'm gonna get one plus y prime squared without the square root. And there's a y prime and the y prime, so that's y prime squared divided by the common denominator, which is uh, root y here and a root y there. And that, which is root of one plus y prime squared equals c. Very simple because y prime squared now cancels. So I'm gonna get uh, one equals c times root y root one plus y squared. Square both sides. So I get one equals c squared y times one plus y squared and solve for uh, y prime squared, sorry. And now solve for y prime. So to do that, I'm gonna divide both sides by c squared y. So I'll get uh, y prime squared equals one over um, c squared y minus one. Now I'm gonna call one over C squared as my parameter 2A for the cycloid, okay? Because uh, it's the same as before, except that we threw out 2G. So we don't have that 2G anymore. So this was K before, 
this was k squared. So k squared and 2g, which I threw out, become 2a. So before it used to be one over Well, anyway, it is right here. One over two g k squared was uh, was two uh, a. My k squared is now c squared, and two g I threw out uh, when I set up my functional. So root two g was thrown out. So that's the reason why it looks different now. But that's not important. The important thing is the differential equation. So um, let me do the differential equation next. So this gives me. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to rewrite this as um, one minus c squared y over c squared y, and because one over c squared is two a, I'm going to uh, c squared is one over two a, so this becomes y prime squared equals two a minus y divided by y. Then take the square root of both sides, and I get y prime equals the root two a minus y over y which is the exact same thing as we got here, the differential equation for the cycloid, uh, which is dy by dx here. So this is the ODE for the cycloid. All right, now we should actually show it's a cycloid. So I'm gonna show it's a cycloid next. In other words, I'm gonna integrate this, okay? So we are now under the heading properties of a cycloid. Okay, we finally finished the modern solution and now we're doing the properties of a cycloid. How do we get the cycloid from this ODE? Uh, we have to do a clever uh, trick. I'll put this here so we can still look at it. <laughs> I'm gonna solve for dx. So dy by dx is that, let me write it again dy by dx is the square root of 2a minus y over y. So if I solve for dx, I'm gonna get dx equals um, root y over 2a minus y. So I bring this to that side times dy. Now I integrate both sides. So if I integrate x, I get the dx, I get x minus x naught, where x naught is some constant. And then here I have root y over root 2a minus y dy. What substitution can be used to um, solve this? It is the famous cycloidal parameterization. If you've never seen this before, you probably will be amazed, but uh, if you've seen it, then it's business as usual. And the parameterization is y equals a times one minus cosine theta. That is the parameterization of a cycloid. So if you differentiate both sides, I get dy. The derivative of cosine is negative sine, so the negative sign goes away. So I get a sine theta d theta. So carrying this out, I get x minus x naught is equal to the integral of y, root y. So that's root a uh, root one minus cosine theta dy, which is a sine theta d theta. And then the denominator, I have two a minus a plus a cosine theta. All right, so that looks pretty interesting already. There's an A that comes from the denominator outside. That's 2A minus A, which is still A. A comes outside, so it becomes root A. The root A and the root A cancel out from numerator and denominator. So I'm just left with an A. So X minus X naught is equal to A times now here, one minus cosine theta is just two sine squared theta over two using the half angle formula. And then uh, sine theta can be written meanwhile as two times sine theta over two cosine theta over two. Again, by the twice angle formula there. And the denominator is gonna be a plus 
a cosine theta and the a has come out. So it's going to be one plus cosine theta, which is two cosine squared theta over two. So all your, all your trigonometry knowledge is useful at this point. So I lose my cosine theta and I have a sine squared uh, theta because this sine squared theta over two with the square root sine just becomes a sine theta over two and combines with the sine theta over two to become sine squared theta over two. Well, two sine squared theta over two is just one minus cosine theta. So this is just integral one minus cosine theta d theta. And now we can integrate this. This is just a times theta minus sine theta. So we have our uh, famous solution for the x direction, but there's an unknown quantity, which is theta naught. So that has to be fixed by the initial condition. What is the initial condition? So let's uh, implement the boundary condition or the initial condition. That is at theta equals zero, the wheel was not yet rolling. So it was at the origin, y equals zero and x was also equal to zero. Now, if y equal to zero, I, I get cosine theta must be equal to one. And that jives with theta equals zero. So we are all safe. Uh, now, if uh, theta equals zero, in, let's look at theta equals zero in this equation. I get a times zero minus sine zero, which is zero. So x minus x naught is gonna be zero, which means x is equal to x naught. But x naught, is zero. So, um, so x naught, this tells us that x naught is zero. Um, so I should have simply written at, at theta equals zero, y equals zero, x equals zero. So this tells me that x naught equals zero. So we have completed the uh, solution to this brackets to current problem. And that is x of theta is a times theta minus sine theta. And y of theta is a times one minus cosine theta. So one of the important properties of uh, the cycloid is that this parameter A is not important. Uh, that's called a scale invariance because when you take dy by dx, the slope will not depend on A, okay? So this uh, slope invariance means that uh, if you have a number of uh, cycloids with the uh, of different sizes so if this small cycloid big cycloid they all reach at the same time the uh, particle reaches at the same time no matter what the value of a is this is kind of peculiar but it kind of makes sense also because if you have a very shallow cycloid it's not able to gain that much acceleration. So it goes slowly and it reaches here. Whereas if you have a steep cycloid, it goes down like that. And so it reaches faster. So there's that uh, property. Then um, the other property of a cycloid is very peculiar. It's called the isochronous property. So uh, that works like this. If you start, if you wanna reach this destination B, you can start here. Or you can start here, or you can start here. The thing is this, if you start here, you have a lot of distance to cover, but it's also very steep. So it's gonna go really fast and cover this distance. If you start from here, it's not gonna go that fast initially because it's not as that steep, but it also has less distance to cover. If you start from here, the initial speed is almost zero because the acceleration is almost zero, and but it doesn't have much distance to go. If you drop, if you put a bead at any of these three points and let them go, they'll all reach B at the same time. That's called the isochronous property. So um, bead release from points A, A prime and A double prime simultaneously arrive at B um, at the same time.
Well, the last uh, property of a cycloid is very interesting. Uh, you can create what's called a cycloidal pendulum. So you can take two cycloids and place them next to each other. Because of this property of the cycloid, it can be shown, and it requires a little bit of uh, showing, of course, that if you have a pendulum, normally a simple pendulum can be used only for small angles because it gets, otherwise it becomes an elliptic integral. So this can be swung at any angle. You can bring it all the way from here and it'll come down like that. It reaches its minimum and then it becomes tangent and then it wraps around. So this, this cycloidal pendulum um, can be used to create a period that is independent of the angle. So the period of the cycloidal pendulum is two pi root L over G, which is the period of a simple pendulum, but this is valid for any angle of swing. So these are the remarkable uh, properties of a cycloid. And by the way, remember, this does not depend on air resistance. So if you make a clock using a cycloidal pendulum and it uh, sort of dies out because you forgot forget to wind it, it'll st still keep good time. And that's uh, one of the remarkable things. It was used by timekeepers and clockmakers 